We're live. Hi. Welcome back. I feel like our theme today is perfect for Halloween. I know. That's kind of why I picked it. Yeah, this is very Halloween-ish. Talking about the paralachez, all the dead people. All the dead people. <laughs> Gotta have all the dead people. <laughs> I love paralachez. I always tell people to go there. How many times have you been there? Um, Probably five or six times, I think. It's I always so go... In the fall, too. For some reason, I always go in September. I've gone in mm -hmm. January a couple times, but I always seem to go in September. I don't know why. And I always end up going on, like, around the same day, which I don't even plan. It's oh, always, like, the 18th or 19th of September every time. <laughs> so, superstitious thing happening. Hi, yeah. Don. Hey, Don. Thanks for coming. We're talking about Père Lachaise today, guys. We're saying it's very Halloween theme, you know? Like, we're talking about dead people trivia it's a great i mean I, I don't know i think this might be one of our questions but there's oh it's not one of our questions there's like a rumor that um john morrison is not actually buried there like they took his body away but his his grave is there but they dug him up and took him somewhere lots of the graves there are actually empty i mean some okay. of the, some of the big people that are there like Moliere and um, Jean de La Fontaine, they're um, most, uh, some of them aren't actually, they're just like an ep uh, epitaph. Is that what they call it? Epitaph? Yeah. That's yeah, it's not, it's not even, a, they're not even there. Not either. It's just a pretty tomb. Mm -hmm. For those who have not been to Père Lachaise, it's absolutely the most beautiful cemetery, in my opinion. I always tell people to go there and they're like, why would I go to a cemetery? Like, <laughs> it's really pretty. Well, and Jim Morrison's is like not even that. I mean, it's now it's it's kind of in the middle of a bunch of graves. And then it used to have a bust on it of his head and somebody stole it. Somebody stole Jim Morrison. Somebody stole it. So, And then they put up a fence around it because so many people were going on to the grave and leaving things. And people now it's always just kind of really messy because people like yeah. throw things into it to go onto the grave or they stick their gum on a tree. Is really thing they're doing. Yeah. Jim Morrison guy, the doors, he's in Paralages and people are just doing terrible things to his grave. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, yeah, they just want to leave their little remembrance, you know, like yeah. Oscars, you know, they kiss Oscars, even though they put up plexiglass because there were so many red lipstick marks on Oscar Wilde that it was ruining the tomb oh, and nice. his descendants were tired of it. So they put up plexiglass and now people kiss the plexiglass, which is just gross. <laughs> worry about that anymore with the pandemic nobody will be kissing the plexi yeah, i don't think i think most people are probably like yeah i'm not gonna do that yeah no thanks yeah well, thank you guys for watching us today don kathy whoever else is watching feel free to drop us a message we'd love to hear from you and we're gonna give you some fun trivia about the Père Lachaise cemetery today claudine has a lot of great information as usual and a lot of things that you probably didn't know so feel free to just throw in some guesses you know about who you think it was she's going to show you some pictures too um but we're just gonna give you fun facts about the Père Lachaise cemetery so much great information in history there i'll let claudine give you a little intro as well yeah so Père Lachaise was actually it got its name because it was actually named after um Père Francois de Lachaise who was a um, obviously pair? He was it was a he was a father of, and he was the confessor of Louis the Fourteenth. So you know, I just imagine you know he has to hear all of these crazy crazy things of, that Louis the Fourteenth had said. But he had a house that was near the chapel that was on the property, which is of what we now know today. So he had this little chapel built, and it was from sixteen eighty two to seventeen oh nine that he was there. And oh, wow. so later, um, when the original cemeteries, like some of them port in, uh, inside Paris, there was um, the Cemetery Innocent, which was, you know, near Leal, which now there's that fountain. Um, that was actually, they, they were overflowing. And so they were, and there was like smells and like, I don't think they probably dealt with bodies the way that they did later in life. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Times. But there was people like there was people that were getting sick. It was pretty bad. So they decided, you know, part of it, too, is that's where the catacombs came from is because they dug up all these cemeteries. 
And so they wanted to put all the cemeteries outside of the city. So the one, um, you know, they were at the time where Père Lachaise is now was outside the city. And so were all the other ones, Montparnasse, all of the other ones. Walmart. So when it was first um, opened in 1804, just, and it was outside of Paris. And it was actually called the Cemetery of the East. But it was so far outside of Paris that <laughs> nobody wanted to go. So um, they, you know, nobody wanted to go there. Nobody wanted to put their loved ones there because, you know, it's just too far to go visit them. So they um, hatched a plan, which we'll kind of talk about one of the two people that they brought out um, to, you know, they brought out some celebrities so that they, they would try to come see him. But the very first burial there was on June 4th and it was a five-year-old little girl. Her name was Adelaide Villeneuve. And she was the very first grave that was there. And since then, you know, it's it's massive. Like, you know, you it's pretty much just like the Louvre. You could go there over and over again. And because it's actually incredibly easy to get lost in there, it's harder than the Louvre. <laughs> <laughs> True. You really do get lost in it. And it's a little creepier because you're surrounded by uh, tombs and dead people when you get lost in Père Lachaise. Yeah. I mean, I've gone many times just by myself and, you know, I'll go like midday on like a really pretty sunny day in the fall or something. So it's not too bad, but there's definitely like, I would not be around, around there when it was like dark out. Well, there's a lot of like parties I heard in there and like the catacombs, like they sneak in through some of the graves there and have crazy underground parties and <laughs> Oh, I hear people get lost in the catacombs and die as well. So, oh. no, thank you. This is no, thank you. <laughs> hey, no, thank you. Nice to have you here, Phyllis. Yeah, Hi, Phyllis. So, definitely going to learn some interesting facts about Perlachez, guys. Thanks for tuning in. We're going to ask you some questions, and we want you to respond. Give us your best guesses, okay? They can be completely wrong. It's fine. We just want you to guess with us. And there's um, like, I didn't, at this time, it's not like these three or four women. There's like all sorts of people. There's men and women. And um, some of them we have talked about on the show. Um, but some of them, you know, I picked some that were uh, pretty well known. Um, but I also stayed away from the really, really well known. I stayed away from the Jim Morrisons and the, and the Oscar Wilde. But um, there's a couple of fun ones in here that you might not have known about. Great. So you can next time on your next trip to Paris at the Père Lachaise, you can remember all this and visit all these graves. Mm -hmm. So let's jump in, guys. Our first question is, who was buried in the coffin she often slept in? So this person, this woman, was sleeping in the coffin, and then she was buried in that coffin. So mm -hmm. who do you think in Paris history... This sounds like a very eccentric person sleeping in a coffin and then was buried in that very same coffin. We actually talked about this woman on the podcast. Yeah, um, I think in actually in just two weeks. Yes, she's coming up. Very interesting person. Can we give them any other clues about her, Claudine? Um, what's another good clue? Well, she was a well, say she she was an actress. She was an actress. Thank you for joining us. It is an interesting topic. Claudine has the best information. I love the cemeteries of Paris. They really My daughter, are. The last week I did talk about uh, the Montmartre Cemetery, and this next week will be Montparnasse. So I picked some of my favorite ones in the newsletter as well. Some very Halloween-y ones. Subscribe mm -hmm. to the newsletter if you're not already doing it, guys. So this person was sleeping in the coffin, and she was also buried in that same coffin. Uh, and her name was... Sarah Bernhardt. Yes. And we were, I was trying to do a screen share on this thing, but we couldn't figure it out today. So I have some of the pictures. That's perfect. On, There's so Sarah's that, tomb. That's Sarah's tomb in Père Lachaise. And um, she had purchased a coffin, um, Elvira. That's a good one. <laughs> um, she, uh, she purchased a coffin at one point because she kind of always had this, she thought when she was younger, she was sick a lot. So she kind of had this morbid kind of a little bit of a fascination with death and so she thought she'd have a coffin to get used to sleeping in it so but she um but she'd also would use it like she'd also lay in it to like rehearse her roles and okay. so then later when she died they actually used that same coffin to bury her in wow i mean well she had a free coffin so that's great. i know yeah you already got it I mean, how many people get to use their coffin in real life, too? I know. Yeah. I mean, I don't know about sleeping in one. That just seems a little strange. It's very uh, economic. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess you can't really move. I mean, you're not going to really toss a turn in there. I guess. <laughs> So, so Inge and Amanda actually got Bernhardt. Nice work, ladies. Good job. And then the subhead, the deep, I'm sorry if I'm saying your name wrong, but the tomb of Apollinaire. Do we know that yes. one? Um, to, uh, Apollinaire is at um, uh, Montparnasse. Oh, okay. That's in Montparnasse. Yeah, and that, there is, I actually have something about his tomb in this week's newsletter. Because oh. there's two. He has two. All oh, right. Tune into the newsletter, guys. So, yeah. next question. Who picked out his grave 10 years before his death and was very specific of the tomb? Okay, so this guy was kind of a control freak, it sounds like. He chose his grave 10 years before, and he was very specific about the tomb. How was he specific about the tomb? He Well, how he wanted, how he wanted the design. He's one of my very favorites. All right. So Claudine talks about this man a lot. He is an artist. He was an artist. He was an artist. He was a creative in Paris. He's French. I don't know if yes. that's how that much. <laughs> and I'm sure Phyllis will probably get it in about three seconds. Um, but yeah, he was very specific on his, he was very specific about his death in general mm -hmm. of how it was going to be carried out. And did he get all his wishes? Like, did they do everything he wanted? Sort of. Did they do weird stuff? Well, the, he he specifically said, no, I don't want a death mask because they would make death masks of people back then. Yeah. And he specifically said he did not want one. And then somebody made him made one anyway. And you could see it at the Louvre, but oh. or like a copy of it. Um, but he uh, but he did kind of the, his tomb itself. He didn't want to have a bust or a statue or anything else on it. And he did get that. All right. Very creepy. Chopin, not Chopin. Good guess, though. Not a bad guess. Good guess. Yes, Catherine, you're definitely right. He was getting, she was getting her money's worth on using the tomb <laughs> for burial. Exactly. Uh, not so. This guy we're talking about now. He chose his grave ten years before, and he was specific about the tomb. Not a bad guess either, Amanda. But keep guessing. This guy was a. French guy, control free. Claudine mm -hmm. loves him. Any other clues we can give them? Um, he painted the ceiling, the center of the ceiling of the Galerie d'Appelant in the Louvre. Oh, let's see how much you guys know about the Louvre. All right, so he's a painter, guys. There's some more information. He was a big deal painter because he got to paint, paint the ceiling of the Louvre. So that's kind of like. Yeah, because it was his dream to be hanging in the Louvre, but at the time, you only were in the Louvre if you you had had to be dead for 10 years before your art could be um, hung in the Louvre. And so he was asked to get the years ceiling. And so he was able to get in the Louvre. He was able to see himself basically in the Louvre before. I love that. You mm -hmm. got it. I'll definitely call you sub. Phyllis, who do you think it is? Do you know? She knows. It was Delacroix. Yes. Eugène Delacroix, and he is one of my very favorites. There's his name, guys. Oh, I get really very good. black. It's very black. It was actually done with like lava stone, and mm -hmm. what he wanted was he wanted to be you know very plain, and he wanted to look like the sarcophagus of a um, a Roman emperor. Oh wow! So it is very. I mean, it is very plain for the great romantic painter that he was. You know, he's. He's famous for painting Liberty Leading the People mm. um, and these beautiful, you know, colorful paintings and frescoes. And, you know, it's kind of I, I was kind of surprised when I saw it the first time. I thought, you know, that it should have been grander. Yeah, it was <laughs> but I do like the black lava rock. That's pretty. Yeah. Extra. I mean, that's not a bad tomb mm. for Delacroix. Yeah. Very cool. Is he actually in there? Or did they put him somewhere else. No, he's in there. He's in there. Well, he should, I mean, I don't know. He's for sure, but I'm pretty sure it is. <laughs> is he yeah, when, they, when he died, they had his um, funeral at the um, Saint Germain du Pre uh -huh. church, and um, Henry Fantin Latour was there, and Baudelaire, and all these other people. And um, Fantin Latour, who is a painter too, who he never knew, you know, he never personally met Delacroix, but he was a huge fan of his. And he was kind of upset that he um, was not 
more, you know, that it wasn't a bigger occasion, like it wasn't a huge state funeral. So afterwards he decided, you know, they all, all these people marched to Père Lachaise for the burial and then Fantin Latour painted a paint, painting that's in the Orsay, that's the homage to Delacroix with a painting of Delacroix in the center and all of these people standing around him. Oh, it's beautiful. For you guys just tuning in, we are talking about the Père Lachaise Cemetery. Perfect timing for Halloween. We we're talking about all the ghosts and dead people that live there and the crazy things they did to their tombs. So feel free to guess. Do we know what year he died? Did you answer that, Claudine? About oh that? my gosh, I can't remember off the top of my head. Yeah, well, you're going to have to Google that one, Amanda. Sorry. Years are, years are difficult. Yeah. Um, whose monumental painting is also on his grave? So this guy painted something huge, and he also had it put on his grave at Père Lachaise. Who do you think it was? It was a painter. Any other clues we can give to them? He was also a romantic painter, and his painting is in the Louvre, very close to Delacroix. Were they, were they buddies? Did they know each other? They Yeah, they were. They were buddies. They did, yeah. Look at Kathy go. She's a smart woman, that Kathy. I mean, I just gave it away because I called Kathy smart. <laughs> Give us more information. On um, who it was? Yes. Well, uh, the painting um, immortalized a certain specific event that happened out on the water. <laughs> I mean, we've already decided. Kathy has it right, guys. It is. It was uh, Jerry Cole. And here is his grave. So you could actually see he wow. was the one who painted um, the Raft of the Medusa that's in the Louvre. That is a beautiful tomb. Yeah. And so there's a huge statue of him on the top. And then the bas relief of the actual painting. But what is really kind of funny is that um, Antoine Etex um, actually created the tomb for him, built the statue. He did everything. But he changed one tiny thing. And I don't know. Whoops. We'll see if you could actually see it here. So down in the corner, see the man with his leg off the raft? Yes. So the original painting, that guy is actually naked. Oh, but on this one, they put the um, Antoine put clothes on him. Yeah, scandalous. I guess maybe it was just too scandalous for the naked man to be in the. <laughs> I recognize that tomb. Though. I've definitely seen that tomb there, and I never knew anything about it. So that's very interesting. That was his painting. Yeah, in the Louvre, and they put it on his tomb. Yeah, it's very cool. Beautiful. I love that. That's one of my favorite because I also love the painter sitting on top with his little uh, yeah painting gear. Yeah. Oh, cool. All Very right. Cool. Next question. Which two great writers were moved to Père Lachaise to draw in more people? Okay. So these guys were dead. They were two very famous writers, French writers, and they moved their bodies to Père Lachaise to make more people want to be put there when they die. This sounds like very grim marketing. They're like, mm -hmm. dead guys are here. You should want to be here too. So, 19th century marketing. 19th century marketing. I want to be, you know, buried where these two were buried. <laughs> they were the original cemetery influencers. <laughs> they were these two guys. I love it. So they were two great writers. Think of two very famous French writers and you'll probably come to it. I mean, these guys were really known in history. And I mentioned them earlier in the beginning. Yeah, she might have already mentioned these guys. So if you were paying attention. Guess which two writers were moved to the Père Lachaise Cemetery after their death, of course, to make more people want to be buried in Père Lachaise. Because this was the problem, is that people didn't really want to go there at first, right? It wasn't no, like... It was way too far out of town. Yeah. Nobody wanted to be buried there because their family couldn't come visit. Yeah. So it was really... It was way too far. I mean, they didn't have the metro. They didn't have any of that stuff. It would take, you know, hours to get out to there. Now there's a wait list. Yeah. You can't even get in now. You actually, um, when you buy a plot there, I mean, certain people um, that have been buried, you know, they, they're they they're always going to be there. But there's actually, you only, you buy it for like 10, 20, 30, 50 years. And oh, when that time is up, if the family doesn't pay for it, you're, you're like evicted out of the cemetery. So they'll actually dig them up 
and wow. move them out. And I guess Jim Morrison actually was supposed to, um, his ran out and then they decided after, you know, much thinking to leave him there. So you're basically leasing a yeah. plot. That's but it's a- kind of, it's so strange to think that you could just be like, could just be forgetting you're done. That's crazy. Where do they put them after? Do we know? I don't know. Masquerade. New catacombs. <laughs> throw them down in the catacombs. Yeah. Um, and it's very expensive. Isn't it like 30 grand or something? I think, yeah, it's very expensive. But the, And there's new there's new graves there all the time. Like I've been there when they've had a funeral or when you walk by and you'll see, you know, a date that says 2000, you know, 17, 18 um, which is always, it's always rather interesting. Cause you just think of every, you just think of it being this really old thing that there's there. I mean, they're literally like, some of them are like, I mean, Jim Morrison's like in the center of other ones. Yeah, that's true. He's just thrown in the center. Yeah. All right, guys, these are some good guesses, but Yvette got it. Moliere is one of the writers that was buried in Père Lachaise and the other was Jean de la Fontaine because they yeah. wanted to bring in more people to the cemetery and get them excited about their deaths. <laughs> and those are their great big, I will say epitaphs. Very because they're not actually there. <laughs> they're not actually there. They're not actually there. They had been actually, um, they actually aren't sure where they are at all. They had been moved so many times that um, they didn't, they they kind of are unsure where they actually are, which is kind of true of a lot of people back then. I mean, because you had the, you know, with the revolution and, you know, graves were desecrated. Uh, but Molière and Fontaine um, actually didn't even like each other. <laughs> they now they're stuck them. next to each other. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> Yeah, even though for the rest of their life, even though they're not actually there, but it did work. It did um, actually draw people to come there to see, and then more people wanted to be buried there. Great marketing. So Moliere and mm-hmm. Jean de la Fontaine. Yeah. All right, guys. Next question: Where will you find ladies wanting to become pregnant lined up? <laughs> so, this is the grave where all the ladies go that are trying to get pregnant. They might be having difficulties getting pregnant, but they go to this grave, and I believe they touch a certain part of the grave as well, mm-hmm. uh, hoping to become pregnant. This one's very interesting. I'm sure if you've been to Père Lachaise, you have seen this grave because. Mm-hmm. Where they're touching this poor man is very obvious. <laughs> it is. Some, yeah. Copper, uh, copper definitely, uh, or bronze definitely changes when it's been touched a lot. It changes colors, guys. Mm-hmm. So if you want to get pregnant, where are you going? Where are you lining up? Which grave is very uh, fertile? <laughs> yeah, Inge is right. It's the European way to make room in the local cemeteries. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like in America, they're not digging people up. You're just there. You buy it for life. It yeah, might- yeah, I don't think. So. Yeah, I mean, I know San Francisco. Like San Francisco doesn't have any cemeteries in the in the city either. Like, there's nobody that you know. There was a whole thing. This one thing I read a oh, long, long time ago about how there's nobody dead in in San Francisco, and all the cemeteries are outside. And so I had a lot of family um, that was long ago in San Francisco, and so we had to go to Oakland Mount, or Mountain Park to the cemetery there is where they were all buried. I mean, that's prime real estate. You can't be yeah. taking up with cemetery. <laughs> yeah, same, I mean, now Paris, I mean, but technically back then there weren't any, you know, once they dug up the innocent, they, there weren't any cemeteries then at the time. That's crazy. Kathy, you are right again, Victor Noir. Let's so see. Victor Noir, I'll show you, I have a few pictures. Everybody's gonna, no, this this one. Look at Victor, man. He is getting felt up in death. Yeah. So he. Uh, him. So here's actually that is not me. I was not going to touch it. <laughs> <laughs> but, Do you want to look at that, guys. So they go over to poor Victor and give him a little touchy I'll touch, him. hoping to get pregnant. <laughs> Yeah, they go and molest him. So Victor Noir, it's actually a pretty interesting story. He was actually a French journalist and he was working for a um, anti-Bonaparte publication. And it was called Le Marseillaise. And um, Napoleon III's cousin, uh, Pierre was like, w- would get really upset with everything they would write about, you know, his his cousin and, you know, the Bonaparte. 
And uh, so he decided that he he called up the publisher and basically said, you know, he wanted to have a duel. He was t forcing him to a duel, you know, a duel to the death. And so the publisher was said, you know, like there's I'm not going to I'm not going to do this. So he sends, you know, this writer for him, Victor Noir, to go meet him. And so they started talking about, you know, the parameters. They had to have a meeting to talk about what they were going to do for the duel. And the, they it ended up turning into an argument. Pierre Bonaparte took out his gun, shot Victor, and he died. That was that. They just yeah. poor Victor Noir. Poor, poor Victor. And so he died and he was first buried in Nui, out, just outside of Paris. And in 1871, they moved him to Père Lachaise. And so they moved him and he was actually ended up becoming quite the public figure. Like everybody knew the story. Everybody really liked him. And so um, they wanted to have a statue built for him for his tomb. So Jules Duru, um, Dulu, who um, created quite a few different statues you've seen in Paris. Um, but he made this one and he took a little bit of an artistic license because apparently Victor was kind of a short, stocky guy, you know, not exactly, you know, the lady killer <laughs> that he is now has become. <laughs> but he but nobody really knows why he designed it the way that he did, giving him the extra added uh, package. Figure. <laughs> yeah. So I guess everyone just saw the statue and they're like, well, that's a good way to become pregnant. Let me just touch that. Like, why? Yeah. So like women are supposed to go up to it and rub it and then they're supposed to like kiss him. So that's why his face actually looks, um, his face is kind of. Oh, yeah. His worn face too. Is off too. Again, gross. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think I'd be kissing a statue in the middle of a anything. Oh, <laughs> Especially when it's been worn out like that. Who knows how many people have kissed? Yeah, that. but it That's is pretty interesting. He's, um, if I remember correctly, he's not that far away from Edith Piaf. So you always have, um, there's always quite a few people. Like that's how sometimes you could find graves. Like if you want to find Jim Morrison, you want to find Edith PF, you just go to where you, where there's a big group of people and you yeah. know, you're going to see something. Cause you know, people do like, they go to the Louvre, they, they go and they have their list of 10 things and they go see them and they go. That's what I do when I visit other countries. I just look for the tour groups, usually the Chinese tour group. And I'm like, follow them. They'll yeah. leave. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where I'm going. Yeah. All right. Good guesses guys. Next question, what former president died in the act with his mistress? So this guy- Naughty questions. <laughs> naughty questions for you guys. Some very naughty, I mean, it's also France. They have to be naughty. This was a former French president and he died while he was in the act with his mistress. Surprise, surprise. And now he is buried in Père Lachaise Cemetery. Do you guys have any ideas? Give us your best guesses. Do we have any other clues for them, Claudine? Mm, he well, he died in Elysee Palace. Elysee, so in the president's home. In the president's home, he was the president. He actually became president, kind of just by chance. He ended up being. Um, he had served um, in in the assembly, and then basically, like they were running for president, and he kind of was tossed in there, and he didn't even expect to ever win. I've never heard of this guy, honestly. Yeah. So if you know this, you guys are good. Not a bad guess, Robert, but it's not him. Mm -hmm. Keep giving us some French presidents in history. Do we know like kind of the timeline of this president? It was 18, uh, 1899. So this is a, a long ago president, guys. Yeah, long ago. This is not Macron. He's still alive. He's still kicking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mitterrand is the one that had, that didn't, is it didn't after a few years at like a, few years ago the book came out with all of the letters with him and his mistress and they had a child together and it was like the big it was a big thing in yeah. france i think that was him yeah mm -hmm. i know i need to read that book you, you influenced me now all right guys this is kind of um obscure so we'll give it to you it was felix far far <laughs> for far, far, for, for I don't know. <laughs> Felix, Felix Farr. He was a former president who was making love with his mistress, died, and now is buried in Paralyzed. 
Yeah, he um, he met this woman, Marguerite Steinhal, in um, Chamonix when he was there in 1897. And when he came back to Paris, he convinced her to come back too. And she would sneak into Elysee Palace at night after all of like the servants and everybody went to sleep. And, you know, they would have their little, you know, tete a tete. And so this one night he she snuck in and she was giving him pleasure, we'll say. <laughs> And he, um, at the moment, at the final moment, we will say, he ended up having a stroke and died. Yeesh. And so the story was that she basically got it her, his, his hands, his fingers were like entwined in her hair. And so she had to get herself out from underneath him and out of his hair. And she like smoothed out her dress and basically left the Elysee Palace. And then they found him. Oh my gosh, she just left him there dead. <laughs> yeah. But you know, Elise Palace was actually Pompadour's, Madame de Pompadour. And um, there's reportedly there was always a secret tunnel underneath. Uh, so Louis the Fifteenth could come and see her. But um it was that was I don't know if that's true because Louis the Fifteenth and Pompadour was pretty out in the open. Yeah. Uh, no I'm hiding. sure there was ways to sneak in and out of it back then. I'm sure there's still secret ways to get yeah. in. Yeah. But his tomb is um, a pretty cool one. Oh yeah, it's beautiful. And he's laying on a bed. It's hard to get. It's hard to get good pictures of when they're like this ones. Oh, that's really. Um, cool. But he's like laying on a bed in a suit, and his hand is kind of reaching over to like the empty side of the bed. So it's like, is he looking for Marguerite? <laughs> <laughs> Well, at least he died in a happy moment. Good That's for true. That's true. <laughs> All right, guys, next question. Who died in Grasse but was driven to Paris so their fans thought she died in their beloved Paris? So she died in the south of France, correct? Yes. And then someone took her dead body, put it in a car, mm -hmm. and drove her back to Paris so that her fans would believe that's where she actually died. Who do we think, guys? It and was a recently did this podcast. This was just recently released. Yes. If you listen to the podcast, you will know the answer to this because we recently chatted about this woman. And give your best guesses. She was born and raised in Paris. She was a singer. Good thing she was little. <laughs> Very small. They called her the little bird, the little the little, little sparrow. Sparrow. She's a little sparrow that Edith. Good job, Don, Kathy, Nancy, Edith Piaf. That is correct. Yes. And that's the grave that probably everybody, when they go to Perlish, has seats. Yes. I would think they would do more for it, you know? Kind of I know. Some of, that's sometimes where I'm surprised, where you would think that it would be. And then you see ones that are just these huge, massive, like, statues and stuff. And then you, you don't even know who they You don't even know who they are. Yeah. Yeah, there's so many that I'm like, I never heard of you, but you have a beautiful grave. Yeah, <laughs> this yeah. is really simple. But her, yeah, her husband, um, Teo, decided because, you know, I mean, Edith is so attached to the, the idea of Paris. I mean, even to all of us, more probably more so even now, that he thought that, you know, her, fran her fans would be upset to know that she didn't die in Paris. So everybody was, you know, against him doing this. And he put her in the car and drove her back to Paris. And then that's when they announced that she had died. Wow. Oh, my gosh. That's so crazy. I can't imagine driving from the south of France to Paris with a dead body. That's a long drive, guys. <laughs> that's not a bad mm -hmm. It is a little strange. Good guesses, guys. Carol, Amanda, Nancy, Kathy, Don. Good job. You all got it. All right, guys. Next question. Who was the original Romeo and Juliet? And they were finally united with the help of Josephine. So these two were the ones that kind of like inspired Romeo and Juliet, right? Like they are the original Romeo and Juliet. They were French. Josephine united them. Uh, do you know their names? They are buried in Père Lachaise. I do know this one because I did a walking tour of Père Lachaise and we talked about this one. And their tomb is so big and pretty. So original Romeo and Juliet, French Romeo and Juliet, Josephine brought them together. You guys, nice guesses. I think we all know these guys. And there's, they're kind of off the beaten track too to find their grave, right? 
I think it took me until my third or fourth time before I got to them. Yeah, I was I was taken directly to them. They're not far from Jim yeah. Morrison, actually. They're and they're kind of they're kind of um, not far from an entrance. Yeah, yeah, so one of the they're main... close to kind of close to a wall. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But the place is, I mean, it's huge. It's very big. I think it's the biggest one there, really. It's and like, there's no like straight paths. Everything is just crazy and people's graves. It's very French, you know. Yeah. Crazy paths, no, no rhyme or reason. Yeah. All right, Claudine, give us the down low. It was Abelor and Eloise, and here is their beautiful tomb. The original Romeo and Juliet guys. The original Romeo and Juliet, and you could kind of see, is so pretty. And when I went there, they were, um, they were, it looks like they're going to start some work because there was a bunch of like um, structural supports and stuff. But um, Abilese and, Elo and uh, Abilese, Ab Abilor and Eloise um, were back in the 12th century and he was a teacher and he fell in love with, he was staying at a rooming house and he um, fell in love with um, the man's niece that lived there. And that was Eloise. And they, you know, had, they would send, send letter, write letters to each other. And they had this like secret little love affair. And so later um, the uncle was furious and, and basically was just like, you, you know, you're going to marry her or you're going to, you know, you're he, cause he was much older than her. And so he, they ended up getting married, but neither one of them really wanted to. And she had become pregnant and she was sent away. And when she was sent away, the uncle and his friends went to go teach him a lesson went to his home and castrated him. Oh. So Eloise, um, they were separated. She was at a, uh, at a convent. He ended up opening and creating the school and a convent and, um, and for uh, the priests and things. And, but they still always stayed in touch. Well, he ended up when he died, he died in 1142 and he was buried at the 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 actual convent that he had created and then she died um 22 years later and when she died she was actually put into his tomb with him oh so they were finally back together um but then josephine in the 1600s all of these letters between them came out came out and i actually have a book it's pretty a big book and it's the, the letters between the two of them and it's really really fascinating because you know it's the 12th century but it became a big thing in the 1600s when they released these letters and so for years you know 200 years later josephine hears about this and so josephine was um you know loved this story and so she was the one that was behind moving them out to Père Lachaise. oh so she brought them back together yeah so and that was shortly after it, that was shortly after it opened so it was pretty much right after moliere and fontaine that um eloise and abelor but they liked each other <laughs> He was castrated. I still want to know what happened to their child because they don't really know in history what happened to the child. Yeah, no. There's, I mean, in any time you have history that that's that long ago, you really kind of some of the some of the information is just lost. Yeah, it's too mm -hmm. long ago. Catherine yeah. had a book too, or someone loved studying them. Very interesting. Original. Yeah, it is really interesting. All right, guys. Next question: Who has golden markers throughout Paris? that sadly don't help you solve the Da Vinci Code. <laughs> I've seen these golden markers. They have a name written on them all around Paris. And this guy is buried in Père Lachaise as well. Mm -hmm. So if you're ever walking around Paris, you may have seen these gold markers. They're in the ground and mm -hmm. they have this name written on them. And I never knew what this was. I'm very happy to learn this today. <laughs> So what people know because of the Da Vinci Code, or that's when people really started to pay attention to them. Yeah. So there's golden markers all around Paris. They don't help you solve the Da Vinci Code, but the Da Vinci Code is connected to them. And many of the ones in the movie actually aren't even there. Like they had ones that were around Par uh, Saint Sulpice. Those aren't there. Some of the ones at the end when he's running, um, you know, there those aren't there. Yeah. I <laughs> love Tom Hanks. It's fine. <laughs> I love that movie. I, I that's the one movie I watch all the time. I love it. I need to watch mm -hmm. it for a long time. Phyllis is right. Tell it me. is Mr. Francois Arigo. Oh, and there he is. 
So that's the face behind it. Um, he was a uh, politician and a scientist, and he um, actually helped um, them figure out and did the uh, metric system, which in the U.S. is something we never, you know, we were told as kids that we were going to have to learn how to to learn metric because the world was going metric, but the U.S. never did. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, but um, in 1994, an artist decided to create the, those markers, and they actually go um, up and down the meridian that was the Paris meridian before it changed to the, the Greenwich meridian is one the world uses now, but originally it was the Paris meridian. And so they do actually go north to south, you can find there's about 135 of them in Paris still. And they start up at um, the observatory, uh, observatory, which is kind of right past lower Luxembourg. So if you go to Luxembourg Garden, there's that long, skinny, skinny end of it. If you keep going, it's that way. And they go through, you'll find them, um, you know, I found them in the Jardin de Luxembourg. You go all um, all the way through there. They even go in the Louvre. There's ones inside the Louvre, oh, wow. which is really cool. And they go across some of them over time. Um, they've been stolen. They've, you know, done construction and they haven't replaced them. Sometimes I find them and then it's like, um, it says Arago in the center and it has a, an N and an S for North and South. But sometimes it looks like they've been turned because they're not, you know, it's like the North is facing East or. <laughs> People just have fun with them. Yeah, but it is, it's pretty fun. It's pretty cool when you could find them. And sometimes you walk right past them. I mean, I probably saw the ones in Luxembourg 10 times before I ever looked down, but there's some in the courtyard of the Louvre outside where the pyramid is. And then they go all the way, all the way, they keep going. Yeah, that's where I saw mine was at the the Louvre. Mm -hmm. you, definitely, you look down guys, not just for dog poo, but also yeah. <laughs> gold in the Argo. All yeah. right, guys, next question. Whose grave do you leave a potato on in the Père Lachaise Cemetery? So if you visit this grave, you're supposed to leave him a potato potato. Why do we leave him a potato, Claudine? Well, I can't say that yet. <laughs> <laughs> Any other clues? Well, he, uh, there's a famous dish, in, a French dish that's named after him Ooh. that is topped with potato, with uh, like whipped potatoes. Okay. So that should be a big clue if you know anything about French cuisine. Mm. This is a delicious dish, by the way. And it, it is called after yeah. him. Catherine, Catherine lives in France. Mm -hmm. She she's she's on her way there. You, I have never seen the potatoes on the grave. Maybe I never actually found his grave though. I think I I I, I didn't find it. Definitely did that. It's kind of it's another one of those ones that's not right on like on a path. It's kind yeah. of. And I was like, I just have this fear. I'd never step on graves. Like, I just feel like I would be like, I would never walk and step on the stones. I just feel like I'm walking on somebody. So there's times where you go there and you literally have like a, this big and you're like sideways trying to get through. <laughs> person. Some of the graves are empty, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Catherine's got it, guys. You leave a potato. Tell us the history. So here is, can you see the potatoes? Yes. Oh my God. There's potatoes. So, so there's actually potatoes on there. It was um, Augustin um, Parmentier. And he was in the 18th century. He was in the French army and he was in Prussia and he was arrested and he was sent. He was in jail there. And all they would feed him was potatoes mm. at the time. Um, back in Paris, you weren't allowed to grow potatoes because they thought potatoes gave you um, leprosy. Oh, so potatoes turn into this real lowly food that the only people they um, they feed, feed it to pigs and to prisoners and that's it. So he was there and he thought, you know, all these potatoes so great and there's all these things, you know, you could do with it. So once he got back into Paris, he entered this contest um, for, and he won first prize because he talked about the whole like these are all the benefits and the great things about a potato. And so at the time, Louis the 16th decided to give him a plot of land just outside of Paris in Neuilly. And so he planted potatoes and then he had it um, put a fence around it. And then he would have guards there that would stay there all night long. But he told the guards to accept bribes 
and oh. to let people sneak in. So they didn't make, they didn't, you know, it wasn't like a huge, huge, you know, barbed wire. He let them sneak in. And so all of a sudden, because then people are like, oh, what is that? You know, what what is that that I can't have? I want to know what that is. So people would go in there and they'd steal the potatoes and they'd take them home and start cooking with them. And then all of a sudden, the potatoes started to be something that was, you know, in fashion again. That's and, so funny. And we all know about the French fries. <laughs> exactly. People want what they can't have. I can't believe no one ate potatoes. I mean, potatoes yeah. are a French staple now. It is. But yeah, so people actually will come and actually bring a potato and leave it there. That's hilarious. The poor man. Can't yeah. get out of potato land. Mm -hmm. Fry land. All right, guys. Next question. This? His name lives on one of the wings of the Louvre and is Claudine's favorite secret library. That's name. a trick. So if you know me, you might be able to get this one easier. Yeah, guys. Okay, so think of all the wings of the Louvre. Each one has a different name. Three. There's three. One of them is this guy, and he also has a secret library that Claudine loves. If you've ever heard talk about love mm -hmm. of the library, and he's also buried in the Père Lachaise Cemetery. So just give us some guesses. I mean, if you can name any wing of the Louvre, you might be able to name this man, who also has. A secret library. Where's the secret library in the Louvre? It's in, it's in the it's in the Louvre. It's there. Uh, there's quite a few actually. They have quite a few different research libraries. Like there's the painting, the painting um, statues. All of these different ones have ones, but this one is it's semi open to the public. You just have to um, get reach out to them in advance and tell them why you want to go there. Um, mm -hmm. But it's my favorite. It was one of my favorite, but it has very strange. It's only open like three hours a day, like three days oh. a week. But um, I love it because then I get to go back, you know, you're going back behind the scenes of the Louvre and you get to go sit in there. And now, um, now the lovely ladies that live, that work there, they've like helped me so many times where I'm like, this is a statue. I can't find anything. One time they actually ended up getting the curator because they, she spent like an hour going through everything she had. And then she got the curator to come and talk to me. That's so cool. So mm -hmm. you go there and you tell them like, I want to learn about French history or I want to look at this book or whatever. And yeah. they let you in. Yeah. You just, I mean, you just have to basically say why. I mean, you can't just be like, I'm going to come hang out and take pictures. Yeah. Um, you just kind of have to tell them why. And then it's Is like, it pretty inside. It's not like a, uh, I mean, it, the, it's, it is pretty. It's not like the, you know, it's not like the Bibliothèque Nationale um, Richelieu, which is like these stunning ceilings and things like that. I mean, it is really pretty, but it is just right. And then when you leave, you go to leave to, if you want to go down the steps, which I've done once because they're just, you know, I've posted pictures of them because it's not like the steps in the Louvre. Like you could tell these are hundreds of years old. Yeah. And you look, there's a window right there and you look right out at Pont des Arts. Oh, that's so cool. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Don was correct. It is Denon. There he is. There he is. He's got a wing of the Louvre named after him and a secret library. So why and is that? So that red rose is actually part of the sculpture. It's not somebody that left one there. Oh, that's beautiful. Which is really cool. But yeah, mm -hmm. it's uh, Dominique Vivant Denon. And he um, was one of the very first curators. He was at a party and Napoleon was talking to him and asked him to come with him to Egypt to do um, on one of his, you know, crusades and and uh, what we could call Napoleon shopping, one of his shopping trips. Shopping. <laughs> and one of his he went stories. down there. Yeah. And it was actually the same time that they had found the Rosetta Stone. And so um, Denon was down there with Napoleon and they were down there finding all of these different things that they brought back to France that a lot of those things are in the Louvre. Um, later on, when Napoleon was out of power and these countries, Italy and Egypt and these countries wanted some of these things back that he just freely took, he negotiated with them for quite a few of them and traded things. So like the Wedding Feast of Cana, which is the biggest, um, biggest, uh, painting in the Louvre that gets completely ignored because it's on the wall opposite of the Mona Lisa. He <laughs> negotiated to keep that. It was also too big for them to send back. But he ended up became one of the the first curator and when it was the Musée Napoléon before it was called the Louvre. Oh, amazing. Yeah. So he did deserve a wing, guys. He saved he, the art. 
He does. He gets his own wing. <laughs> Very cool. Carol, the red room. <laughs> All right, guys. So this guy completely changed Paris. Yet his tomb is very plain in the Père Lachaise Cemetery. So what Frenchman comes to mind? He completely renovated Paris, you could say. Um, but his tomb in Père Lachaise is uh, not much to look at. So no, this is? Kind of, it's definitely probably the most surprising that is actually kind of boring. Yeah. And it doesn't have railings doesn't have anything like that like many of the things he left behind in paris do <laughs> family didn't love him <laughs> so this guy renovated paris but his tomb is rather sad <laughs> they didn't do much for this poor man no nope, they just tossed him in there with the rest of his family oh okay so they're all in one mass one in there what's his family family mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Kathy and Don are correct. Haussmann. Yes. Mr. Baron Osman. There he is. And that's pretty boring compared to what he did. Yeah. I mean, there's not, it's not like, oh, wow, who's this? It's kind of like yeah. one of those. Yeah. But he, in um, 1853, Napoleon III asked him because he wasn't very happy with the man that he had before him, who was the um, prefect of the Seine, Jean-Jacques Berger. And so he had asked um, Haussmann to, you know, he wanted to clean up the city and give it these grand boulevards and vistas and stuff. So he asked Haussmann to do it. And, you know, definitely the rest of history, some people, you know, at the time, of course, Nobody really liked it because they were, you know, completely leveling whole areas and streets and people lost their houses. Um, and so some people still, you know, we that's there's nothing great about that. But I don't think Par I don't think the Paris that we see today would be there if it wasn't for Houseman that we know of. Yeah, I mean, completely changed Paris and his tomb is sad. I it's know. Like, give him a red rose. I know, uh, he needs a little something. <laughs> need something all right guys next question this guy they named a delicious french cheese after him <laughs> and he's buried in Père Lachaise as well so think of some delicious french cheeses creamy and creamy do we get any other clues about sometimes this sometimes in the fall they put truffles in the center of it it's yeah. the, literally the greatest thing you'll ever eat in your life I've actually never had this cheese. Oh. I'm looking at the man's name and I haven't had it. I need to he get was, it. Yeah, he was a lawyer and a food writer so very long ago. I mean, he was kind of, you know, a food influencer a very long time ago. And he was an uh, early adapter of the term Epicurious. Oh, that's fun. Mm -hmm. So they named this cheese that was actually called, um, originally called Ex Exosois after him um but his descendants and his family didn't like that idea so much but the cheese oh, is yeah. like him. these are some good guesses guys yvette camembert don Comte. oh you're making me hungry <laughs> it's my favorite i love Comte, and i actually just mm. discovered a cheese called napoleon which is oh, yes i love napoleon. it's so good it's like a better Comte. Mm -hmm. i did so nice good. woman's house delicious napoleon uh, Camembert, Camembert, Comte, Comte, Napoleon's my favorite. Um, guys, this is a tough one, so I don't think you're gonna get it. But Claudine, which it is, is the cheese is actually called Briat Savarin, and it is named after again. Here, we don't have it's not as very exciting, yeah, it's pretty plain tomb, pretty tomb. Um, also, you will notice the mums on there. Here's yeah. another little tip. Never, ever take a planted mum to a French person's house or put it really inside your house because it's so attached to graves and everything that there's a superstition that if you bring a mum to your house, you're inviting death in. Oh, God. a little fun fact for you on a Sunday. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> yeah, but they, yeah, so they named this cheese after him, which is like, um, you know, usually it's pretty thick. I've had it where they slice it in half and then put a layer of truffles in it. And it's just like, I mean, it just like, it's one of those cheeses that just oozes, which is I mean, delicious. I think I've eaten it and didn't know what it was called because I've definitely seen that cheese before. It's so good. Delicious. Everyone needs to come to France, eat some and cheese. And you can find, I found it, I found it in the US. I haven't found it with the truffles, 
but yeah. I found the cheese um, here in the U.S. So if you do check your uh, next time you go to this store in your cheese section and see if you can find it because it's delicious. Brillant Savoir. Yes. I like that. All right, guys. Who denied? Who was denied a Catholic mass, but she was given the first state funeral for a writer? So they wouldn't give this woman a Catholic mass, but they did give her a state funeral, and it was the first time France has ever done that for a writer. Who do you think it was? It was a woman. She was a writer. They wouldn't give her Catholic mass, but they did give her a state funeral. First one ever for a writer. She had yeah. sinful ways. Yes, she did. <laughs> we talked about her on the podcast. Yes, and I think we've already released that one. Yes, we have. Mm -hmm. If you were listening, you would know about this sinful woman who didn't deserve a Catholic mass in the church's eyes. <laughs> <laughs> but she did get a state funeral, which is not too bad. Not a bad guess, In That's a pretty good guess. Any other guesses, guys? This was a woman. She was a famous writer. She was denied a Catholic mass for her sinful ways, but she did get a state funeral. Lucky her. Phyllis says Colette. Good guess, Phyllis. Robert says Colette. Good guess, Robert. You guys are correct. It was Colette. It was Colette. Years later, they decided to um, give her, let her have a mass. I think it was 50 years after her death. And they did it at a church in Bellevue, which is where, you know, she was born. But yes, it was Miss Colette. There she is. There she is. That looks like a newer tombstone. It is. It's that like a red, kind of a red stone. But it yeah. was only 1954. I mean, it wasn't really that long ago. Yeah, it looks super new though. Yeah, she was a long time. Yeah, but she, yeah, she wasn't, uh, they didn't, they said that she couldn't have a Catholic mass. So, but the state funeral went from um, it. They there was a procession that started at at her home, you know, and uh, in Palais Royal, and they follow. There was um, like tens of thousands of people following wow. her tomb, following the procession to Père Lachaise. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. She was loved, but not yeah. by the church. No. <laughs> <laughs> Famously quoted as saying, America is my country, but Paris is my home. Besides me. Claudine <laughs> <laughs> was quoted as saying that as well. Um, <laughs> buried in the Père Lachaise Cemetery. She's obviously American because America is my mm -hmm. country, but Paris is my home. Who do we think that was? And I think you're right that Colette did not care about Yeah, that. I don't think she cared. I don't think that was a huge important no. thing for her by any standards. But who do we think was talking about America as her home? No, Paris is her home. America is her country. Oh, we got some good guessers in this group. Don, Phyllis, Kathy, you are all correct. It is Gertrude Stein. It is Miss Gertrude. Hers is pretty simple too. Yeah, and uh, she um, she was buried with her partner Alice, and Alice's name is on the back. It's kind of hard to see these, but it says Alice B. Toklas. Um, But she ended. She died in Nui. This whole entire thing has like five or six different connections to the city of Nui. <laughs> yeah. um, but she ended up dying there. She was having uh, surgery. She had stomach cancer. She was having surgery and she actually died in, in surgery. Oh. And uh, she was then, of course, you know, buried in Père Lachaise. She was never obviously returned to America. Well, she got buried in her home. Yes. For Gertrude. I think she would have wanted it that way. I think so too. All right, guys, this is our last question. If you can get this, you're a genius, but you're still a genius for playing along with us anyway. <laughs> Everyone gets a gold star. All right, guys, this stunning work of art tops the memorial dedicated to Greek soldiers that served in the Siege of Paris and World War I and World War II. Okay, so it's a stunning work of art. This is artwork that is on top of a memorial dedicated to the Greek soldiers that served in the Siege of Paris and World War One and World War Two. So do you guys have any idea what famous artwork is on top of this memorial? You will know this because there's also in the Louvre, right? Yes. And it's one of my very favorite things again. 
Yeah. But the, the key, the key trick there is Greek. Yeah, Greek. So this is dedicated to Greek soldiers, but you would know this work of art. Obviously, it's a copy. Um, and a much smaller version. Much smaller version than what you see in the Louvre, but when you enter the Louvre, you see this thing, and it's at the top of these grand steps. And you walk up, and it's like, whoa, it's one of my favorites, too. I remember the first time I saw it, I was like, wow, what is that? And the story of it is amazing as well. I know. I love it. I sit there. I sit in awe. I sit, I move around the whole all the <laughs> corners and sit there and just look at it. I mean, it's so much more fascinating when you know the history about it. Mm -hmm. um, guys, Amanda and Kathy are correct. The winged victory. It is. So there, the first okay. time I ever went there, I walked right in this gate and saw it. Wow. And so it's a vi wing victory of Samothrace, and if, it is, of course, in the Louvre. Uh, but it was erected and put on that column. The city of Paris donated the this portion of the land, and a, it was built to comm commemorate all of the Greek um, soldiers that volunteered with the French army for the Commune, World War One, and World War Two. And so it's only been there since 1953. Oh, it's relatively new. Yeah. I mean, I've never seen it. I've been to Père Lachaise multiple times. Mm -hmm. Very cool. I it's think that one of my, it's like my, it's pretty much my, one of my favorite things in the Louvre too. So the first time I went, I walked in and then I looked and I was like, oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> it's so, and the, where they placed it is perfect at the top of those steps. It's like, it is. It so, is yeah. You guys, thank you so much for playing along with us today and answering our questions. I hope you guys learned something new. Claudine is a historical genius. She has all the information. Subscribe to her newsletter. Listen to our podcast, uh, La Vie Creative. Every Monday we talk about a new French creative or just a creative person in French history, more likely. Some of them are American from other countries. Um, and every Monday you can tune in for free. Just look up La Vie Creative on iTunes, Spotify, anywhere you can listen to podcasts. You will hear me and Claudine talking about all of history's creatives. And then every Wednesday I talk to living creatives. <laughs> it's not just all dead people. I'm going to do a living person one of these days. Maybe yeah. Catherine Deneuve. We're going yeah. to talk about a living person. <laughs> We're going to talk about some living people in the French history, creative lives. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We both have Patreon pages as well. If you would like to donate, we offer all kinds of fun things on there. Claudine's Patreon is patreon.com forward slash Claudine Hemingway. Correct. Blue Bon Rouge. Claudine Blue Bon Rouge. Blue or no, Blue. just Blue Bon Rouge. Sorry. Blue Bon Rouge. Well, if you go to our web website, Claudine Hemingway, you can find out yes. all the information, claudinehemingway.com. And mine is Miss Paris Photo. So thank you guys so much. And we hope to see you again in another two weeks. We'll be doing another another trivia with you. What yeah, are we I think I'm going to do it since it's November 1st and it's All Saints Day. I think I'm going to do, um, we'll do like the saints and some of the churches of Paris, some of oh. my favorite ones. So that yeah. should be really fun. And tomorrow's podcast um, episode is about Camille Claudel. Yeah. And Every, you know, I think everybody knows that name because she was the mistress of Rodin. Um, it's a very sad and kind of tragic story, but um, she was pretty, I mean, she was an amazing artist. And so definitely check that one out tomorrow. Yep. So listen, you can listen anywhere. Just type La Vie Creative Podcast on Google and it will pop right up. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And we Thank will you so much see you.